So now, every time I fart in public, I'll think of one of the greatest Japanese authors to have ever lived. And that's the power of literature. Better than food, man. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as usual. Today is Natsume Soseki's Kusamakura, sent to me by a French fan named Leslie that was very kind. I really appreciate it. If you were one of those very generous souls who was going to send me some books in the near future, please hold off for just a little bit while I get this new address set up because I'm moving. I'm moving to another state. And if you're a patron, you can hear all about that. Uh, that's why my output's going to be a little bit, you know. So thank you very much, Leslie. I loved this book. I thought this was awesome. I think I, you know, we're all stressed out. We're all completely stressed in day-to-day -day life. And a lot of the novels that are great books, you know, phenomenal books and stories are very stressful. Uh, that, you know, conflict is essential for so many narratives for them to, you know, function properly. And this is the exception. This is not a stressful novel at all. It's still a novel. It's still kind of a story. It is a story. I mean, there may be some debate to this because this is one of the unique things about Kusamakura. There is really no conflict and the story goes nowhere. It's not about story, it's about a feeling. And it's a meditative feeling. It's a very calming, tranquil feeling. It's a haiku novel, right? And somehow it maintains this balance of strange humor, introspection, and wisdom, yet it's not really, it, the story doesn't go anywhere. It does, I mean, there's no development in plot. There's no character development, really. Um, and you can fall asleep to it, but it's so pleasant. It's, it's kind of like, um, it's like an Ozu film. Or it's like a film by this fellow whose name I can't pronounce for the life of me. A Thai director named Apicha Pong Varasathakul. You should check him out. He did Uncle Boon Me, who can recall his past lives, and he did Syndromes in a Century. And they're extremely meditative and beautiful to experience without having to connect the dots in a normal narrative sense. You just sit there and let them wash over you, wash over you like waves. It's like um, taking a walk at the beach. That's what this novel is. It's like taking a walk at the beach or in the mountains, going on a hike going everywhere and nowhere. And that's what this book is about too. Literally, it's about a man taking a hike up to an onsen, up to an inn, you know, this, this spa in the mountains, away from the toil of everyday life down below. Soseki was called the first great Japanese novelist by Susan Sontag, one of my favorite authors. He's loved by Haruki Murakami, who I've not read yet, and Glenn Gould, the virtuoso pianist. And a big thanks to Damien Flanagan, who seems to be an expert on Natsume Soseki and, uh, and also on Yukio Mishima. He's a very interesting author. You can check out these talks he gives on YouTube, which I found really, really fascinating. That's where I, where I discovered the connection between Glenn Gould and Natsume Soseki. There's tons of supplementary material there if you're interested, so I would check those out. I found his stuff very useful in understanding Soseki and his, his place in literature, and, uh, and then the connection between him and Glenn Gould. I thought that was fascinating. So when you're reading this book, the perfect soundtrack is Box Aria from the Goldberg Variations, played by Glenn Gould. I'd say the re-recording, uh, the later one, when he's much older, which is after he read Kusamakura. And there's Flanagan is uh, wondering what the effect of reading that book, becoming obsessed with that book, had on Gould. You know, when uh, he was obsessed with it for the last 15 years of his life. So by the time he re-recorded the Goldberg Variations by Bach, which he was famous for, which launched him into fame at 22, you know, he had, he had read this book quite a bit and you hear it in the, <laughs> you can hear it or project it, you know, in the music, very slow, calm, questioning, meditative, like a walk. It's beautiful and so sad. Yeah, it, didn't, it, it put me in a not so good place for about a 24 hours. Soseki was highly influential in modern Japanese literature. He's considered to be one of the best. He had a very sad childhood, had a bunch of siblings. He was an unwanted child, and so he was adopted by another couple, but then they divorced, and so when he was still a kid, he went back to his 
original folks, and it just seems like he wasn't wanted. And the theme of tragic displacement is recurring in Soseki's life. Soseki was part of the Meiji era in Japan when the country was going through radical changes, opening up to the rest of the world and Western influence. He was a late bloomer. He's a, he's a huge late bloomer success story. He didn't start until 1904. He didn't start writing until 1904 when he was already 37. He's one of Japan's most influential modern authors. So he was sent to London for two years of his life by the Japanese government to learn about English literature, to become an expert in English literature so he could come back and teach it. So he gets over there, it's dismal, he hates it, he's broke because the exchange rate sucked, and he's under this enormous pressure to be the, the guy who brings this back to his country, you know? And he has a breakdown, he starts going insane, he starts thinking people are watching him on the streets. Uh, <laughs> And there's some of that in Kusamakura, because this is, of course, written after all of that happened. So he, there, you see a little bit of his paranoia in a, come into play in a really, really humorous manner. Uh, when the narrator is talking about detectives following him on the streets, uh, measuring or, or counting the number of times he farts in public. Yeah, you think it's all like <laughs> delicate and classy and, and floral and poetic, and it is. And then he drops something like that. That's the funny thing about Soseki is he, he like, there's this good balance that is completely unexpected. Like the humor is very, not childish, but just uh, simple and just funny, you know, goofy, a little goofy. So now, every time I fart in public, I'll think of one of the greatest Japanese authors to have ever lived. And that's the power of literature. He's also buying too many books, right? He's spending like a third of his income on books because, well, London has books and they're expensive. And I think uh, I would probably do this, the same thing in his position, to be honest. While he's over there though, he starts reading. He just sequesters himself, you know, he, he, he isolates himself in his room and he just reads and reads and reads and reads and reads, reads all kinds of stuff. And he starts developing this question, you know, like, what is literature? How do you get an objective view of it? What, you know, what is it? And he starts to put together this theory of literature. He also said something like trying to understand literature by reading is like washing off blood with blood. I thought that was great. In an article by that fellow Damien Flanagan, he says that Soseki rejected the idea that a writer, or indeed a painter, was someone who depicted the world around them. Rather, he believed that an artist was someone who depicted a reflection of the world that had been transformed by the mirror of their own internal consciousness. It's great. So the book, Kusamakura, which means the grass pillow, seems like nonsense until you read the book. Uh, the English title, when it was translated, I think in the 60s, into English, is uh, The Three-Cornered World. The title refers to a part of the book where the narrator is discussing what it means to be an artist, and he writes, I suppose you could say that an artist is a person who lives in the triangle which remains after the angle which we may call common sense has been removed from this four-cornered world. Which is great. It starts off like this. As I climb the mountain path, I ponder. If you work by reason, you grow rough-edged. If you choose to dip your oar into sentiment's stream, it will sweep you away. Demanding your own way only serves to constrain you. However you look at it, the human world is not an easy place to live. And when its difficulties intensify, you find yourself longing to leave that world and dwell in some easier one. And then, when you understand at last that difficulties will dog you wherever you may live, this is when poetry and art are born. So it's this artist in his 30s, and he's traveling up this mountain path, and he, he's trying to get away from everything so he can go and create art, so he can go and express himself. He's not sure what the perfect expression is, but he's creating haikus while he's going through these meditations and these thoughts and digressions and ponderings on art and artists, Japanese, Chinese, and Western. Thoughts on culture, nature, poetry, painting, and literature. And he's trying to paint. That's, that's one of the things he attempts to do in the book. You know, he, he goes up there to try and paint. And he can't do it. <laughs> he's searching for the perfect expression for himself, it seems. You know, he's, he's searching. He's searching. 
He's idealistic and judgmental and fussy. He's sort of a, a little bit lofty. And he's seeking to be non-emotional. He decides he's going to step back from reality like uh, stepping out of a painting and just observing it, you know, non-emotionally, without, uh, you know, objectively, like from a distance, to try and, and, and determine the aesthetic value of it, it seems, uh, while not being attached to anything. Sosaki actually began writing as a way to combat his mental condition, for therapy, it seems. So he travels to this spa, this onsen, and he stays at the inn there, and he meets the strange innkeeper's daughter, who he's heard about from various town folk. There's a lot of gossip about her tragic past, and one of her ancestors threw herself, drowned herself in a pond, which reminds the narrator, the artist, of uh, Ophelia, the, the painting by Millet. So this innkeeper's daughter, this mysterious strange woman who's sort of shifting and always keeping him off balance and appearing and then disappearing, uh, reminds him of this, this painting of this woman who jumped in a pond to commit suicide. So that's a constant theme. It doesn't really go anywhere. Uh, at one point, he thinks she's going to jump into a pond. She even talks about drowning herself, I think, uh, but nothing happens. Nothing happens. Doesn't go through with it. So he plays with expectation quite a bit, but it has this eerie quality to it. And she appears and reappears at night in this inn in various places. It gives the novel this strange, tranquil ghost story atmosphere from time to time. It's cool. The narrator seems to fall in love with her, sort of, or the idea of her, but not really. Again, there's no real plot or conflict in this story. It's just this feeling, this quiet, relaxing atmosphere. And the feeling I've read that he wanted to communicate was just one of beauty through his descriptions of nature and art and the thoughts and ideas he has. And that's refreshing. For me, that, that's refreshing because so many novels are trying to do something or be something. It's about the mechanisms, you know, the narrative mechanisms. It, we're, we're all about these mechanisms and, and systems and these ways to get results that sort of, yes, they're effective and, and often crucial, you know, for, you know, form is often crucial for, for telling these stories, but um, you, you lose something which is like, I don't know, the dream quality, something like that. You know, I just watched this clip of David Lynch behind the scenes of the new Twin Peaks episode just getting fucking pissed because his producers were telling him they only had, you know, like two days to shoot in this, in this place. And he was like, this is, he's like, I'm never working like this again. It, it just didn't allow him the space to dream, to let things come to you. You know, because film is so expensive, and so that's that's what that's what happens, unfortunately, because it's all about money, um, which is depressing. Books are not like that. Novels are not like that. The novel is the novel is such a shifting, strange, um, elusive thing, right? You can't like what is a novel? Does it have a, a a cover and a back and everything in 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 between the there that's whatever you know it's like i don't know what is literature for that matter so the dream quality is captured and allowed to breathe in this it's like a very deep breath it's like a nice meditation session and it's short too you know this is maybe 150 or so something like that pages and uh, you know you'll finish it pretty quick. I've read that Soseki has stated there is no plot, that he wanted to write a haiku novel. Here's from the introduction. In a brief piece entitled My Kusamakura, Soseki stated that his aim had been to write a haiku style novel. Previous novels, he said, were works in the manner of the senryu, the earthier version of haiku that looks at everyday human life with a wryly humorous eye. But it seems to me, he wrote, that we should also have the haiku-style novel that lives through beauty. He had written Kusamakra in a spirit precisely opposite to the common idea of what a novel is. All that matters in this work is that a certain feeling, a feeling of beauty, 
remain with the reader. I have no other objective. Thus, there is no plot and no development of events. Sure, you could probably exploit that and be lazy. You know, use it as an excuse to write gibberish and then just say that people don't understand it. Maybe if you're young and, and juvenile, but um, that it, you you can read this book. It doesn't come off like that at all. I mean, it's it's sort of like the Lynchian thing. You you have these questions. You know, again, I don't know. There's an interesting parallel him and Lynch because Lynch is always bringing up questions, and they don't really go anywhere necessarily. They're never answered. But your mind is always working. Your mind's always struggling to to put it together, and it's really engaging because of it. And so it's the same with Kusamakura. It's the same with Soseki. You know, you never get these answers. You're always wondering what the connection is. Like life, right? You're wondering what the connection is. And you're always, you're always sort of projecting your own ideas on all these characters and the, the events that are unfolding in front of you. But you never really get an answer. It gives you this feeling of going everywhere, down to the depths of the human soul, and at the same time, absolutely nowhere. It's... It's like you're thinking when you're taking a walk. The novel, this novel and the idea of the novel is amazing. The richness and complexity of the form, the, the, the permutations, it's incredible. It's unlike anything else. You know, the more I read, the older I get, the more I realize this is something so un, ungraspable. You can be as traditional or experimental as you like. This is an experimental novel, you could argue, but it's coming from, it's written by somebody who has a great respect for tradition, for art in certain traditions. And so many artists and authors and poets and painters are mentioned in this. It's great. That's half the fun is just reading about these, these ancient artists who you, you, I have never heard of before. You know, some, the Western ones, sure, but not, uh, not, not some of the Japanese and Chinese ones, you know, some of these ancient haiku poets or, or, uh, it's such a pleasure to read. <sighs> I'm even relaxed just reviewing this. I was all stressed out. And now I'm just talking about it and thinking about it and it's actually just lowering my stress level. It's really nice. While we live in this world with its daily business, forced to walk the tightrope of profit and loss, true love is an empty thing and the wealth before our eyes mere dust. The reputation we grasp at the glory that we seize is surely like the honey that the cunning bee will seem sweetly to brew only to leave his sting within it as he flies. What we call pleasure, in fact, contains all suffering since it arises from attachment. Only thanks to the existence of the poet and the painter are we able to imbibe the essence of this dualistic world, to taste the purity of its very bones and marrow. The artist feasts on mists, he sips the dew, appraising this hue and assessing that, and he does not lament the moment of death. The delight of artists lies not in attachment to objects, but in taking the object into the self, becoming one with it. Once he has become the object, no space can be found on this vast earth of ours where he might stand firmly as himself. He has cast off the dust of the sullied self and become a traveler clad in tattered robes, drinking down the infinities of pure mountain winds. It's not because I wish to put on superior airs to browbeat those who are tainted with the marketplace that I thus strive to imagine this realm. My only intention is to tell the happy news of the salvation that lies there and to beckon those who have ears to hear. The fact of the matter is that the realms of poetry and art are already amply present in each one of us. Our years may pass unheeded until we find ourselves in groaning decrepitude, but when we turn to re recollect our life and enumerate the vic vicissitudes of our history and experience, then surely we will be able to call up with delight some moment when we have forgotten our sullied selves, a moment that lingers still, just as even a rotting corpse will yet emit a faint glow. Anyone who cannot do so cannot call his life worth living. There's also this anxiety about technology, the changes in Japan, the influence of the West, and war, you know? The, this is at the time of the, the, the Russo-Japanese War, and there's, there's a little bit about that in the book. There's a, 
uh, a boy he meets who's going off to war, a soldier. And there's this steam engine scene near the end. This is, you know, early 1900s. So the steam engine represents the, he, he describes it as the serpent that is going to just take, you know, men off to war to die, basically. And it's, you know, the symbol of technology, the symbol of, of the new era. And he's fascinated by it. But he's, he's not so, so quick to embrace it at all. And it's interesting because his descriptions are just sort of the, these, they're, they're almost prophetic, you know, these descriptions of technology and, and this new age. Uh, because it, World War I breaks out, you know, what, uh, a decade after this book is, is written, something like that. And so, and then followed by World War II and both of those wars, you know, just technology, new technology, new ways to, to coldly eradicate huge swaths of humanity uh, are employed. And so it's interesting. It's interesting. Could almost, he could just feel the, the century that was coming. And he died young, you know, he died, I think at 50, or about 50. And uh, uh, not too long after he, he wrote all these great books, these what are considered now masterpieces. While many are thrilled about the plunge into modernity, Natsume, not so much. And Kusamakura reflects this. Soseki said he wrote this in the space of a week. What's my excuse, right, you know? <laughs> he had a fascinating literary theory that went along the lines of you can't really read the same book twice. You can't reread a book. Literature is something that is constantly reinvented. How you read the same book will change along with you. You're reading a different book because you're in a different space, a different time, a different place. You're older, whatever, you know? You're in a different country, you're in a different so on and so forth. When you read a book, Context is so crucial, it's so critical, it's, it all depends. The same book that I read is not going to be the same book that you read. And the same book that I read five years from now will not be the same book that I read today. What do you think about that? It reminds me again of the, the Glenn Gould story because Glenn Gould was obsessed with this book for the last 15 years of his life, right? He died, there were two books on his, his bedside table, the Bible and Kusamakura. He even reads from it, there's a clip of him reading from it on YouTube. So better than food, absolutely better than food. If you loved Ira's uh, episode in the life of a landscape painter, which I reviewed recently, which is a fantastic book about, has a lot of similarities with that one. Um, artist traveling through nature, trying to capture this essence of it. Uh, definitely for you. I would, I would highly recommend you check this one out. If you like Virgil, uh, the poetry of Virgil, if you liked Juan Rulfo's Pedro Paramo, if you were a fan of Mishima, of course, if you like Japanese authors in general, you should start here. This seems to be the, the, uh, the base, right? The, the foundation for modern Japanese literature. Woman in the Dunes by Kobo Abe, I loved that book. Um, if you enjoyed that, you should definitely check this out. And of course, if you liked Thomas Bernhard's The Loser, which is all about Glenn Gould. So, yeah, if you enjoyed any of those, highly recommend it. Kusum Makara by Natsumi Soseki. Thanks again for sending that, Leslie. I really appreciate it. Loved it. All right, now who's going to get it? Going to do the coffee lottery. If you would like to know more about the coffee lottery and get in on it, you can check the description box below for instructions. And I am very happy to pass this along. Da, 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 da. Let's see. Whoa. Miriam. Miriam is going to get Kusamakura by Natsumi Soseki. Thank you so much, Miriam. Miriam has been a longtime supporter of the show, and I, I can't thank her enough. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food. You can donate a dollar or more and get access to patron-only reviews. Plus, you can hear about all the behind-the-scenes updates of what's going to be happening What's in store for this year? It's all very exciting. Because um, I am leaving St. Petersburg, Florida. I am not really a Floridian. <laughs> so I'm going to go somewhere totally opposite. <laughs> it's very exciting. I'll get Four Seasons again. 
and uh, the, the winter will be brutal. Can't wait. All right, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. If you would hit, hit me up on Facebook and give me a like there, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, coffee mugs, if you like. Description box below, super cool. Uh, hope you're all doing very well. And always remember, die reading. Die reading, die reading. Get as much in there as you can. And go out reading. So thank you so much for watching. Really appreciate it. Please subscribe if you have not already. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great night. Take care. Ciao.